all the problems that it is in our own life. They become lesser and the road will be paid for him to come and establish his justice on earth. اللهم صل على محمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين وتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين عليهم السلام اللهم عجل في فرج مولانا صاحب الأسر والزمان اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن سرباتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طبيلا إن شاء الله this wanting of the moment did you come? Is sometimes we say we are asking for him to come and we know that for sure he is waiting for us to shape up so he will appear and the justice will be established. Allah subhanahu wa the Holy Quran says in Allah لا يغير ما بقومن حتى يغير وضع أنفسهم Allah will not change the condition of the people Assalamu alaikum unless they change their own condition. So we are asking Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, to change us, to make us the one that Allah wants, so Imam Mahdi will appear, and justice and peace will be established on earth, inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa subject that we are going to discuss tonight is the problem that it is uh, in our own mind. One thing I would like to tell you, there was a time that the group of Khabarej, they were established in, within the uh, heart of the Muslims. Khabarej believed that they have their own circle and everybody goes to hell except them. Today, the same concept of Khawarij is established with another group that they call themselves uh, Wahhabism. And they say the same thing, that everybody goes to hell except those that they follow Wahhabis, which is 300 years old. Now today, we will see many of the fatwas that it is given, that the uh, reason that all the prophets came to destroy all of the shrines, even though the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not go to destroy the shrine of his mother and take him out of the grave. Yet, he went and he gave salam to her and he stayed at him, his mother. And then, if that was the situation that they are talking about, then they shouldn't have been at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the uh, cemetery of the Baqi, which is next to Medina. Therefore, they are not really is establishing a new idea. Their goal is to root out Islam as a whole. First, attacking the shrines, then attacking the shrine of Rasulullah as it is a fatwa. I have heard it myself from Ben Baz. Then the next one is to destroy the Kaaba and finally, Quran is a history. It's a satir of Akwali. So we go ahead and get away from it, that one too. That is a goal. Now, going to tearing down the uh, uh, shrine of the Hujrat Nahadi or Hujrat Nahodai, whatever that they call him, that uh, I have been in his uh, shrine many times and I noticed that he is a Sahaba of Rasulullah. Being so uh, impolite and being so cruel and unjust and un Islamic, actually, it is something that they have done. So inshallah with the permission of uh Alhamdulillah present, we go ahead and discuss some of these issues. And then after that question I answer inshallah. Did you want to go to this room or you want to sit all of you back in there? That's up to you. Alright. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدي وحبيبي ونور قلبي وثمرة فعادي ابن القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المحسونين الهاديين المهديين الذين أذب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجهم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إن الله أوحى إلى شعيب قائلا يا شعيب إني معذب من قومك ألف مئة ألف أربعين ألف من شرارهم وستين ألف من خيارهم فقال شعيب ما بال خيارهم فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى إنهم داهنوا أهل الأهل المعاصي فلم يغضبوا لغضب. This hadith, brothers and sisters, that I just read is a Rasul al-Kafi, number fifty-six. The hadith is about narration that was revealed to our Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam. The narration said that Allah sent a revelation to Shu'aib and said to him, Ya Shu'aib, I am punishing 100,000 of your people. 100,000. However, out of those 100,000, 40,000 is for, I'm punishing, I'm punishing 40,000 of the bad ones. But then 60,000 for the good people. Now listen carefully, brothers and sisters. Now this is so amazing that Allah said, I'm, pun I'm punishing 100,000. But out of the 100,000, 40,000 are the bad ones. And the 60,000 are the good ones. Shu'aib alayhi salam asked, Ya Allah, the bad ones, I understand, because they're bad. But the good ones, why? One. Two. Why is it that the number of the good ones are higher than the bad ones? The good ones, Allah says 60,000. The bad ones, 40. Why is it that, number one, the good people, they also deserve your punishment. And not only they deserve your punishment, their number is higher than the bad ones. Then Allah has said, Shu'aib, Ya Shu'aib, Innahum, the good ones, the reason why I'm punishing the good people among your Ummah more than the bad ones is because the good ones they heard and saw the sins were taking place and they did not show any concern about that sin. And because Allah was disobeyed, haram was done in their presence, and they failed to do something about it. That is why they deserve more punishment than the good ones. That is one hadith. Hadith number two. This happened at the time of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. They said after Musa and Musa alayhi salam, at the time of Musa alayhi salam, there was a village. Where people used to live in there. And that village, they turned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They started sinning, doing haram. 
And that village, they used to be as a head abbey. A man who's pious, fearful. That man, he decided to leave people alone. And decided to take a place in his room. All he worries is about him and Allah's. All he worries is about his relationship. Salat, fasting, doing everything in his room. But he doesn't care about anything outside. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to punish them. The narration said when Allah sent Jibreel to go and punish the people, he came and he met that man. He was in the state of sajda. Then Jibreel went back. They didn't punish him. He went back. So, Ya Rab, I went there. I saw among the bad people there is one good one. Who I found he was in the state of sajda. So what should I do, Ya Allah? Because you know, brothers and sisters, the custom of Allah is that He does not punish whatever He wants to punish people. The good ones who do whatever they're supposed to do, Allah tells them to leave the place. Example, the people of Lut. Lut alayhi salam, when Allah wanted to punish His people, Allah told him, Ya Allah, Ya Lut, I want to punish your people. But you and those who believe in you, you have to leave the night. And they live before Allah punish them. Another prophet, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, when Allah went there to punish his people, Allah told him, take the good ones with you on the ark, so that the bad ones deserve my punishment. So the sunnah of Allah is that he does not punish people when there is a good one among them. Unless they didn't do what they supposed to do. So Jabrail, when he saw that he knew, so he went back to Allah. Ya Rab, I saw wajad to him rajulan sajidan. I found one sajid among them. You know what Allah said to him? Allah said, Ya Jabrail, bihi tabda. The punishment should start on that sajid, that army. Allah. Ya Rab. He's in the state of sajda. He is a servant. He's praying. Allah said, Ya Jabrail, the punishment should start on him first before it goes to any bad ones. Why? Jabrail asked. He says, Allah answered to Jabrail. He said, What good his ibadah does to me when I be disobeyed and he doesn't show any anger about it? And this is okay. He sees it, but he doesn't show anything. That is why it's very important to speak about these things. At least, at least it is our duty, responsibility Islamically, to show our disagreement with this type of action. Not doing so is a great sin. That if Allah decided to punish them, we will not be spared from that punishment. If we don't do anything about it. That is why it's very important that we have to speak about these things. Now let me give you a little background about who is Hijr or Hujr ibn Adi. Just to get about an, an idea about it. Number one, Hijr ibn Adi and his last name is known Al Kendi. This man was known to be one of their closest companions to the Prophet. In other words, as we are to talk about him, we call him Sahabi. Now listen brothers, let me give you the silsila, the chain. How we have in Islam, people who saw the Prophet, didn't see the Prophet, came after the Prophet. What do they call them in the Helm al diraya in Ilm al-Hadith? Number one, they said that as sahabi as a person who lived at the, at the time of the Prophet and saw the Prophet. They call him Sahabi. Whether he believes in the Prophet or doesn't believe in the Prophet, they call him Sahabi. Now listen, the Quran used the same term for that man. Now look, Quran calls the kuffar that the Prophet is your companion. وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ Allah called the Prophet Sahib. And musahaba is companionship. To accompany with somebody at the same time. That's called sahaba, a suhaba. Now, any person who lived at the time of the Prophet so the Prophet is called Sahabi. Now, another group is 
called Khadrami. They are the group of people who lived at the time of the Prophet, but they didn't get the chance to see him. That's called Al Khadram. Now, then you come at the, at the second and third group are the people who did not live at the time of the Prophet. Actually, they came after Prophet death. But they saw people who saw the Prophet, who lived with the Prophet. They called them at Tabi'in. That's the first generation after the Prophet. Now, after those also, there is another group also who came, which we can call them second generation after the Prophet. They call them Tabi'in. -tab okay, that's the silsila. And then Tabi'in, -tab Tabi'in, and so on and so forth. But the point I want to make is that the word Sahabi is the man who lived at the time of the Prophet, lived and saw the Prophet. It's called Sahabi. Now, this Hujr is known to be Sahabi, companion of the Prophet. He saw the Prophet, he lived with the Prophet, and also was a believer. Now, until the Prophet died, he was with the Prophet, and then after the Prophet, he followed. He was one of the very, very few Muslims who followed the the wasiyah and the will of the Prophet. Because remember, brothers and sisters, I'm just going to go through the history a little, just to familiarize with the history. You know, after the Prophet, the Muslims divided into three groups, automatically. After the Prophet death, there are Muslims, the entire Muslim who used to be one at the time of the Prophet, one Ummah, at the time of the death of the Prophet, they became three groups. Group number one, they are the group of Ansar, who divided themselves and thought that they deserve to be the leaders of the Muslims after the Prophet. That is group number one. Group number two are the Muhajireen, the immigrants who also thought they have the right. And there is a long dispute between the two groups because each one of them thought they deserve to be the leaders. That is number two. Group number three, they are what we call Khullas, the chosen one, the true group which are very few compared to two groups that we mentioned about. One of those few groups are Hujur ibn Adi. Who thought that and told the other groups that no, after the Prophet is Ali. And also stop, stand by his feet, reminding people about the sayings of the Prophet in different places. Now, <clears throat> after the Prophet wasallam, the entire Muslims changed. Now what happened? The components of the Prophet Ahlul Bayt became the center of hate. That it got to the point where at the time after the, after the Prophet, they started to curse Ahlul Bayt and especially Imam Ali on the platform. And this continued for years, brothers and sisters. And by the way, for your information, today when you go to our masajid, right now as we speak, every Friday when the Imam goes to the khutbah, after he finished the khutbah, he says, Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'id al qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkar wal baqi wal dhikru Allahi akbar Allahu ya'lam ma tasna'un Every Jum'ah that you go, right? Right? The last, the last words of the Imam before he goes to read the prayer is this ayah. Now let me let you know that this ayah that you have, you hear today, it used to be what they used to curse Imam Ali Easter. Easter, when Imam gives the khutbah on the Jummah prayer, before he goes to lead the prayer, the last word he will say before he starts the prayer is to do the la'at on Imam Ali alayhi salam. Then, until at the time of Umar ibn, uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he was the one who came and stopped the curse and exchange it with this ayah. And it became a sunnah up today as we speak. So now when you hear these ayahs, remember that instead of this ayah, it used to be, and I quote, these are their words, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. From their word they say, Allahumma la'an, and then they mention Imam Ali's name. Allahumma la'an, then they mention Imam Ali. Three times. It got to the point, bro, this is history and the fact. It got to the point sometimes, when Imam forget to curse Imam Ali, he prayed with the people Salat al Jum'ah. He then remembered that I forgot to curse Imam to curse Imam Ali. He said, "Our Salat is bathing." Can you imagine how worse the situation was? 
Sarah was wrong. Sarah is bad. Why? Because I feel I forgot to curse Imam Ali. So what should we do? I say you have to come back again. He brought people back to the masjid. He went on the member for the second time. He read the two khutbas, cursed Imam Ali, and then read the prayer. Now our salat is makbu. That was the situation, brothers and sisters. And what is happening? All this is taking place, but there was no courage people to stop and speak up. As we mentioned about the hadith of Prophet Shuaib, nobody was saying anything. Except very few of them. One of the very few people who come up to speak. And brothers, as we say, now the history repeats itself. The history, we just mentioned about what's what, what used to happen at the time of Imam Ali. But before I continue, Allahu Akbar, Imam Ali was there, right? What did he say? Something that's something that I used to think. Because it started when he was alive. Right? He was there. He, he is that he is being cursed on the member. What did he do? Now the narrator said, some of the companions even came to Imam Ali and they asked him, Ya Amir al muminin you know you've been cursed on the manabar, right? They said, Yes, I know. I know. What should we do? They asked Imam Ali, what is our responsibility? He said, Imam Ali, he said, Da'uhum. He said, Stay away from them. Wala tusallu bitilkan masajid. Don't pray in those masajid. Why? He said, Fa'innaha masajid mal'una. Those masajid are cursed by Allah. Don't do. Don't go. But then he said to them, Now listen, I'm talking about the wajib shari comes here. Then Imam Ali alayhi salam said to them, the one who asked, he said, but you have to stand by the truth. That's what he said. He didn't say, go and defend me, go tell, me, tell them not to come. No, he said, but find the truth and stay with the truth. That's what Imam Ali told him. From that day, people like Hijr or Hijr, they started to speak up. To talk. When they hear somebody cursing, they stop them. If they hear somebody say something about Imam Ali, they stand against that person. Until one day in the Salat al Jumu'ah, Hajar bin Adi was in the masjid. The Imam started to say bad things about Imam Ali. Allahu Akbar. Hajar raised his hand. Allahu Akbar. What a courageous man. Then he said to him, he said, Stop. And some narration, they said it was Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He was the one who was the leader and he was saying bad things about Imam Ali cursing, then he stopped him. That was his crime. That is all the crime of Hijr. They didn't call him drinking alcohol, they didn't call him stealing, but they call him defending the truth. And that was his crime. They took him to the custody, Hijr ibn Ali, they took him to custody. First they asked him, you have to denounce Imam Ali. Say no to Imam Ali. They said, no, I'm not going to say no to Imam Ali. Why would I denounce a man, Allah, and the Prophet of He said, I can't denounce him. Then they said to him, if you fail to denounce Imam Ali and curse him, I said, that will cost you your life. Oh, today, brothers and sisters, Allah, history repeats itself. Today, you and I, when we see this, even speaking about this type of injustice, we don't want to do it. Now look at Hajar at that time. They said, if you denounce, if you fail to denounce him, it will cost your life. Hajar said, so be it. Who is my wife? They brought Hajar. And his son and some of the companions were with him too, who were supporting Hajar. Some of them said they were six, they all were brought. When they brought them, first Hajar when they decided they're going to kill them. And their crime is, they love Imam Ali alayhi salam. Now, before they kill Hajar, Hajar said, no, don't kill me first. What do you want? He said, I want you to kill my son first. Allahu Akbar. Your son first? Why your son? He said, I don't want to be killed. And my son sees how I get killed. Maybe he might get scared and leave the path. So I want him to be killed so that I'm sure that my son dies on the path of Wilayah. Allah Akbar. And that's exactly what happened. They killed his son in front of him. After they killed him, after they killed the son, 
they brought Hajar. And Hajar, when they brought him, and you know Hajar, he was one of the half of the Quran too. Memorized the entire Quran. When he brought him, his hands was chained, the legs was chained. <coughs> and they faced him towards the Qibla. When they faced him towards the Qibla, before they killed him, he read this ayah. فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَتْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ When you read this ayah, they became angry. Why is he talking to the ayah of the Quran? Then they turned him towards the West. Then he read another ayah. لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ أَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Then they said, Turn him on his face down. Allah. Like even they are angry with the Quran. The man was reading the Quran and every, every face they turn him, he remember ayah to read and they become angry and they turn him. From the Qibla to the, to the worst and then now they face him to the ground. He was facing ground and he read this ayah to Minha khalaqnaakum wa fiha نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَعَةً أُخْرَى You were created from it, from the earth, and to it you shall return, and from it you will be resurrected again. While he was in that state, as when the Hijr ibn Adi was killed. Some of the mentioned that the night he was killed, the day he was killed, his killer, Muawiyah, was not able to sleep. He was not able to sleep. What, what happened? The narration said that that night, every time Muawiyah closed his eyes, he sees Hijr. And he started running in the, walking in the room, say, Waili min Hijr. Waili min Hijr. And he was going around the room saying this, Waili min Hijr. That why did I kill Hijr? Woe unto me from killing Hijr. That was. This is just a summary about what happened about Hijrat. Now this man, as we mentioned, brothers and sisters, he was killed, Mavloom. He was killed wrongly. Now what happened? Now after his death, now we see that even that injustice didn't stop. They still do injustice again after, after that. Brothers and sisters, now let me take you to the fiqh part. In the fiqh, we have what we call Al-Faqh ala Madaib al-Khamsa. They're written by Sir, uh, Sheikh Jawad Mugniya. It's a five school of thought. In that book, when you get a chance, just take a look at it. Just to know that this group, they have nothing to do with any Islam. This Madaib al-Khamsa, every scholar, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Hanbal, and then Ahl al-Bayt in combined, they all give their rulings in terms of fiqh. Now check in there. And check the verb called nabshul qabr. Nabshul qabr, meaning digging a grave. After somebody is dead and buried, is it okay to open the grave or not? Allah, not one of them, one of them said that it's okay to open a grave. None. Every one of the five school of thought they say it's haram to open a grave after the person is buried. Except in certain situations. Except which is not to do, it has nothing to do with this situation. In situation number one, they said, if a person was buried, a Muslim is buried in the non-Muslim grave, for example. And then later on we find out that no, we bury him in the wrong place. Knowing that the body has not been destroyed, then we can move them. Or if a person is buried in a place we know it's the right place, but we are worried maybe he might be attacked or might be opened by another a person or animal, for example. Then it's allowed to, to move the person. That is the situation. That is. But other than that, to go and open a grave and take a person out of the grave after they are buried is haram and it is considered one of the kabair. One of the major sins. So now, these people, which school of thought do you want to put them in? 
Imam Malik is followers, Imam Shafi is followers, or Imam Hanbal, or Imam Ja'ab, which followers are they? This is one of the proof that these people are not Muslims. Because a true Muslim follows at least one of the Maraja, one of the school of thought. And if your school of thought doesn't allow that, why do you do that? That is question number one. Question number two, their problem, what they say, they said that because a Shia go there and they build the on the grave, which is shirk. Allahu Akbar. Now I'm not gonna bring you any hadith from that from the Prophet or Imam. Just with the Quran. If you go to Surah Al Kahf, brothers and sisters, build it on the grave. Just speaking about the building of the grave. And inshallah, maybe someday if Allah give us a chance, we might talk about this subject in details. About building on the grave. Is it haram? Is it halal? Was it done before? Was it just started by the Ummah of the Prophet? Or before the Prophet, the people used to build that on the grave or not? Which one? But just simple answer for this question. Let me say, when you go to the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, Surah Al-Kahf, Surah Al-Kahf talks about the people of Cave, right? People of Cave, we all know, we heard about them. None of them is Prophet. One. Two. None of them is Sahabi of the Prophet, right? They were Quran described them. And now I'm fit here to Amanu Birabim. Was it now Huda? They were youth who were believers, good people. That's it. No more than that. Now, after these people were discovered, according to the Quran, they were discovered, they found them, who they were, and they decided, those people are Sahabal Kaab, they decided to die. They didn't want to live in this world. Now, after they pass away, now listen to the Quran. After they pass away, the people of that time, they said that to whom? To the entire world. And Quran taught them. Because if they were talking about haram, Allah would not call them. Right? Now, what did they say? They coded, Allah coded them by saying that those people of that time, they said, Lanat. That those graves that they will build, those Ashab al Kaab, we will take the shrines to be a masjid. And look at the Quran. Just the Quran talks about two emphases. Lam, la, and then the noon, natakhidanna. No need to keep two emphases, Quran mentioned. That they said we will take their shrines to be a masjid, place of prayers. Now, brothers and sisters, if it was haram to build on the shrine, Allah will quote them. One. Two. If it was haram to build on the shrine of a good people where we go and pray and make dua, if it was haram, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't make a comment about it? Huh? Now, after that, we never heard any prophet came and was against what, what they said. Quran said in Surah al -Jab. And they took the place to become a place of worship and place of ibadah. That is in concern of when it comes to these things, brothers and sisters. For that matter, when we want to understand about this particular group, there is a clear evidence that these people are not, they don't belong to Islam. They are people who have different agenda. But they came in the form of Islam in order to achieve their, their goals. Mm -hmm. But the real Islam is far away from them. But here comes to our responsibilities, brothers and sisters. What is our responsibilities at this time? What do we have to do when we live in this part of the world and we notice what's going on? It is our duty, every single one of us, to make sure that at least we denounce this act. Between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first thing. That in my heart, I have to denounce that, Ya Allah, you are my witness. If, I, if this action that is going on, Ya Allah, I am far away from them. Because you have to know, as we know, part of our belief is that we call tawalli and tabarri. We have to denounce the enemies of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. That is number one, our responsibility. Responsibility number two is that we all have to speak about it. At least at the level of our limitation. Whatever I can, at workplace, 
with my children, with my family, I have to elder, and I have to let people around me know that I am disagreeing with this act that is taking place. That is number two. And number three, if I can contact any person I know who can make difference to stop this type of action, I have to. Because this action, brothers and sisters, if this will happen with the Hujr, if this is not stopped, trust me, it's not going to stop. It's going to go to another person. And it's going to go to another shrine. And then at the end, it's going to get to even Habib al-Mustafa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa For that matter, we are responsible. If I know anybody who can make any difference, if I know any person who can vote this out, it is our job to contact them and have them make difference to stop this type of crime. That is responsibility number three. Responsibility number four. If one can help in any capacity to rebuild this type of places, then I have to do that. Anything that I can help out, small or a, a, a small amount or a big amount, if there is any way that I can serve or help in one way or another to make sure that that shrine is rebuilt the way it was, or even better than what it was, then that is also my responsibility. At least all these things are showing that I am disagreeing with this act, and I am not part of it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to stand against injustice, Ya Rabbi Allah. And Ya Allah, we ask you, these people, Ya Allah, if they are capable of guidance, Ya Allah, show them your life. If they are not capable of seeing or deserve your light, Ya Allah, our guidance, Ya Allah, treat them with what you know they deserve, Ya Allah.